In this video, I'm playing backgammon versus a bot with my friend Jacques Rawl. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoy this video. Please like and subscribe, and you'll be notified every time I upload a new video. Please let me know what you think in the comments below and what you like to see in future videos so I can work on that. My book, Backgammon, Backgammon Strategies, is available. There's a link in the description to where you can get it. And if you're interested in lessons, please contact me via email. My email address is in the description again in this video. It's my pleasure to have my friend Jacques Rawl. Thank you for joining me, and welcome. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to our three-point match this evening. My pleasure. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. I'm glad the spring is on the horizon, so it's getting warmer here where we live in Frankfurt, so uh, it's getting good, yeah. Yes, yes. You were telling me you live in Frankfurt, but you're originally from South Africa. Is that correct? Exactly. I'm born and bred in South Africa. I've been living now in Germany for about 15 years, so uh, I like it here, and this is where I recently were introduced to backgammon with uh, through my Bulgarian uh, girlfriend, she introduced me to it. So, uh, oh, good. I was gonna ask you how you got into backgammon. So, how long have you been playing? Um, playing since just the basic rules, I guess about three years now. But since I realized you can play it in tournaments and you can actually study for it, let's say one and a half to two years. So, I never realized there was competitions available until, of course, you scratch the surface and then a complete new world opens up. So Great. Just, uh, we've been going on a good journey and uh, it's exciting, yes. I know. I had some Bulgarian guests recently and I know there are three versions um, that they have in Bulgaria. One is like the traditional backgammon, just no doubling cube and no backgammons. And then there's a different one in Greece. It's called Plakoto. It's uh, with like pinning. And the mm -hmm. other one is this other one that is different because they, everyone goes in the same, both players go in the same direction. Exactly, but since I want to improve my skills in Pagaman, I just try to focus on this. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll go ahead and play. Okay, here we go. Are you able to see the screen now? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank my you. pleasure. We're playing on a beautiful gammon or board. I selected the blue color because these, this is similar to the color of your board. Uh, okay. The board is made by Rain. He makes beautiful boards. Uh, he makes the XG boards. If you're interested, there's a link in the description. So it's a three-point match. Uh, Jacques, you will be playing the blue checkers at the bottom, XG the white checkers at the top, and you're uh, welcome to consult with me, but as a guest, you always have the final decision. So with the three one, it's uh, you know clear, of course. The five points, yes, of course. <laughs> yes. Okay. So five four. four, I take one to the eight, and uh, I'll go one to the twenty here. Okay. Mm. Sometimes uh, when you're behind in the race and the opponent has so many checkers in the zone, you have to be careful of splitting. Mm, absolutely yes but um i was thinking of maybe going to the nine as well but uh i'd like to get my back checkers a bit out to give them flexibility so okay. we'll see what it looks like in the analysis okay of course very good now double six all right we don't have a double quite yet right no no okay mm -hmm. three two okay so Uh, I will. I'm thinking of um, bringing a 24 to the 21, perhaps, and the six to the four. The reason for the 24, 21 is because if I leave it on the 24, it might be a goalkeeper, as I say. But at the same time, it's also blocked the six and five. But it's, it's more difficult to come out. So I wish to give it some flexibility to jump over the the 18, 17 point there. So I guess some people think about these things. Uh... If the checker is back, is that an asset or is, is it a liability? Right now we're down by 26 pips in the race. I guess if we were ahead, we'd want to get things moving. Do you mm. feel like you want to get things moving soon? Or? Well, if, you know, if we're that far behind in the race, then of course um, it's not a question for me racing now. Yes, that would be maybe a bit uh, immature, premature to do that. So from uh, from that point of view, okay, the 6-4... Looks good and the eight five. Yeah. So, and if you're doubled here, what would you do? If I'm doubled here, I would take. Yes. You take? Okay, let's see. Let's see. The the other option would be just go to here. But yeah, we could do we could do that's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, double. 
<laughs> you knew it coming, huh? you saw it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when when you're considering doubling decisions, um, like what are the things that, that go through your mind? What are you thinking well, about? Okay. Let's say I have Blotz and he's a home board and it's like this, a position like this. I... I try to figure out if it's easy for me to get out, if he either kicks me on his next move, or if he makes a point, or if he brings more cover in for the outfield. And at the moment, of course, uh, my two back blots there doesn't look comfortable, but I don't think they're completely out of the question and playing. And because if I feel if I get kicked on, let's say the five point, I can still come in, you know, with three open blots there, squares there. So, um, and also, my own home board is still quite open, but it's it's flexible to create more points. So, uh, and uh, his uh, his uh, 18s is still blocked by my 12s, so it's not so easy for him to bring it home. So this is why I would consider a take. So some of the things that I think about is, um, what I always like to think about is that there are four primary strategies to win in backgammon without using the doubling cube. The first is the race, which is the simplest way. You just bring everything home. Uh, the second is by priming, uh, and White has a little bit of a prime here. The third is attacking, which White can certainly do. And the mm -hmm. fourth is a defensive strategy where you maintain contact, maybe have an anchor. Um, so if you're looking at this for White, White is certainly leading in the race so that's by a lot so that's very good uh white does have a little bit of priming options but white has significant attacking options in which case a gammon uh on a two cube wins the match uh and then on the other hand we don't really we don't have an anchor of course so mm -hmm. even if white rolls like a six two probably hit loose especially given that we have this blot here uh so these are the things like I think about, especially at this score, you know, at three-away, three-away, um, you have to double a little bit more aggressively and take more cautiously uh, because mm -hmm. a loss on a two-cube, a single loss gets the opponent to the Crawford game and a double gammon loses the match. Uh, mm -hmm. But with all that being said, what would you like to do? You're welcome to... Well, uh, you made a good case for not accepting it, but um, let's uh, stick to my original guns and find okay. out. Yep, we'll see. Okay, so take now six three did not hit two one. Okay, that doesn't help my back. Lots there. So five four, and uh, I don't want to do anything else. I guess six four then. Mm -hmm. Just safe. Okay. Yeah. Four three. Okay. Six five. Okay, so let's see, five, hmm. but now it won't be easy to come out, maybe I can come out of a six, because that's what you call, I think, the Cinderella distance, if I mm -hmm. remember correctly, and then the five to eight. Yep, I, I feel like the, the more important reason to come out with a six is because then you have a five here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Five, three, hit. Okay, we have a chance. Six, two. So the two is forced and the six. Um, I Let's have a look. If I just bring it down to the, <clears throat> to the eight. Yeah, I think that's the safest now. Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't want okay. to leave a blot on my own board. Right. Okay, six, two is hit. Four, two. Okay, so good. So two was the hit and then the four. Four. Do I want to risk no on a ninth? Then I'll be back. But otherwise, if I play eight, four, that's stacking. It doesn't give me any flexibility. So the question is, if I put it uh, down to nine, then uh, how many options does he have on it? One, two, three, four. He has got lots of numbers of hitting there. And if he hits with the blot on my home board, can I get easily back in? And if I weigh all this up against the other safer, non-flexible move of to eight four, okay, there's no risk of getting hit immediately. Yeah, okay, this looks a bit safer. So this because this gives me flexibility in getting my back uh, checker out of his home board. Um, yeah. So I think this is a bit better without adding risk to the game now. Yeah, now there's also. Sure... Yes. Go ahead, please. 
because now I need to make sure uh, I need to start catching up with the race and I don't want to give them unnecessary exposure to my bloods. Right. The other thing is if you play like this, um, he can actually hit you with this blot too, on this blot too, on the other side mm -hmm. with like yes. a six or a four from the bar. That's true. Yes. Then I'm just a sitting duck there. Yeah. Okay. Five, one. Okay. So now, okay. now five, one. Five one, so I can uh, oof, make the either the point or jump. Let's see. Oh, but if I jump, where's my one? Right. So, yeah, there's no real one left. So I will make the three point. Yes. Yeah, I think that's good. It makes yeah. use of this builder, makes this four point board the best four point board. Because what do they also call now it? There's a, sorry to interrupt you. Yes. They call it the barrel four point. This four point board. Oh, okay. okay. So because I also expect if the dice doesn't go his way now, he might start crunching. And this is um, good for me there for the timing point of view, getting out. And yes, yes. Getting closer, yeah. Okay. Three, two. Okay, so now yeah. they say every roll is a doubling decision. Yes. And that's difficult to remember during a match. And maybe you've had it yourself. It's like you yeah. catch yourself rolling the dice and says, why didn't I consider a double at least, you know? <laughs> right so okay so now let's see i can hit or i can jump out and these sixes are blocked from the seven to my 13 this other one so i feel quite strong here in this position of course i'm a little bit behind the race but this doesn't mean a lot if he can't move i have a chance of kicking um, if i don't kick him and i still come out what does this look like with his his blood on a one that's the only thing if he comes out immediately, how can I cover it? So, and of course, I must also consider my market because if I don't offer a double now and I, I roll good and he rolls bad, I might completely miss my market. So, um, I think I will double now here. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes. Okay, so six four. So let's have a look. Six four. Four and a six. If I should come down to three, maybe. Yeah. Because then I leave myself room for either kicking his uh, blood still and coming out. And I have one extra checker now on my home board for flexibility and either kicking him or, um, you know, making a point there too or something. So I think I'll go with this one. Do you think this blot will be here next roll? Um, if it's not there, if it's if it's not there available to kick, then that means his position might be either more crunched or he has moved some of his outfield checkers, which would give me an opportunity to jump out. Or if he, he crunched, but he makes a point where I stand, let's say he throws four, three, um, yeah, okay, then I have only one point to come in. Then it's a question of race. Can I get in before he comes completely out? Or something like this. Um, just, uh, just give me the other option. Take those two back, please, at the bottom. Yeah. The other thing um, I was gonna, I was looking at is like, let's say you do this, um, and look at all the cut. The only way white can cover is with a one, right? So six one works because six can come here and one. What about five one? I don't think white can cover with a five one. Because there's a white, no. there's a one, so it would have to be here. So five one's okay. What about four one? Yeah, he can't. Well, he can kick me on the twenty three. I hope, but I. And, but you I still don't. have the block. What about three one? Well, no. Yeah, what about well, three one would come here. Um, what about two one? Yeah. I guess it would be okay because you're covering maybe. You just take the one, yeah. Or because he might draw the full three. That's the only thing I really am thinking about. Yeah, yeah. So the other one you wanted to look at is something like this? Yeah, just, uh, yeah, just to uh, put it there. It's This is very safe. Of course, he can't easily go out of his sixes. Or he might have to break it and jump and leave me a hit. This is good. Then I guess the question for me is to ask is do I go this route or do I hope to kick another blot of him? A checker of him uh, to get maybe a you know a gammon okay but it's already four so we don't need gammons anymore yeah so this is the part of the, the equation that we don't have to play for gammons anymore we just need to win 
So, and if we do this, the race is effectively equal at the moment. So, um, So what do you think your, your game plan is? Is it to uh, race, prime, attack, or contact? My original thought was um, with that uh, six down to the six, four down to the three, was the idea of, of trapping him and then uh, blocking him in so that he basically dances um, and doesn't come out. Right, attacking, out. okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is my original instinct that I that I played there. Uh, the other version that you showed is uh, seems lower risk, um, sort of easier to get home unless, of course, he has some jokers or something. Because if he comes out with his seven and run, I can maybe kick him on a seven that's exposed there. But um, I still have four checkers on my thirteen, so I don't know how easy is that you know, to come to bring home in a safe way. So I think let's go with my original plan and see how that goes, please. Okay. We'll see. All right, four, three, we're hit. That's okay, because yeah. there's still five. Okay, so now there's some blots. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, so now... Now I'm in danger. Okay, so we'll see what happens. I think... Well, of course, this will be the only game of the match and then i'll save it uh so just give me a moment please i'll put this i'll do this on autopilot okay now we'll analyze it so let's see well played Experts 5.96, very good. So we'll look at we'll look at all the moves. So the 3 1 was clear, of course. Then the 5 4, this is the one we were talking about. Yes. Okay. So when it's like this, so I've studied these. I'll show you this one. Um so I'll put it on the other board. Okay. okay. So this is the same position, right? So yeah. let's say white made the three point with a five three instead you see this yes i see it yes mm -hmm. okay and now you have a five four so in the original position it was like this yes in the modified position it's like this the difference is white has these two checkers here whereas in the original position they're they're over here yeah, so that, that means there's more checkers in the zone here are fewer checkers in the zone. So when there are that many checkers in the zone, you have to be careful of splitting. But now here, I think you can split. How would you play 5-4 here? Um, like the original one, down to 8 and to 20. Yeah. yeah. So that so is, that's the difference, uh, fewer builders. Yeah, so here it's correct to split like this, resulting in this position. Whereas in the original position here, um, Splitting like this is actually a blunder because what happens is, you know, if you get pointed on with a 3-1, double-1, double-3, or double-4, or even hit loose with 6-2 and 5-3, things like that, or 4-3, there's just too many attacking checkers in the zone to carry out a blitz. Mm -hmm. uh, when there are fewer checkers in the zone, it's going to take a little bit more time to get these in here to complete the blitz. Yes. Um, this is something that Mochi talked about in his new book, um, Back in Masterclass. Have you seen that one? Um, I haven't got it yet. No, no. I'm still it's, reading it's uh, good... the one from Tirdo. Oh, yeah. That one's very good, too. I like that one. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So the 3 2, yeah, it looked like this is the one we were talking about. So, what is the suggested move? To... Let's have a look. Oof, okay. They were close. Actually, your first instinct looked best, like to come up mm -hmm. and come down, resulting in this position. This mm -hmm. duplicates the small numbers. And then the other one we looked at, the 13-8, like this, was virtually tied. Okay, yeah. But uh, it might be correct, the second one, but for me, it just feels so passive. It just take it from the 13 to the 8, and there's no flexibility instead of just... It only brings a checker closer to home, and okay, of course, it's a builder for the inner board, but it feels um, 
it doesn't add so much, you know, by feeding if I go like this. When you have a second checker on the eight point uh, and you roll numbers like double four or double five, you're able to make two inner board points without breaking the eight point. Okay. Yeah. So that's something to always think about. Now, the doubling decision. So it was a double and it was a take. So good. Then it was a two one. Nothing great here, was there? Let's see what it likes. It likes 13, 11, 5, 4. Oh, 13, 11, that is... Uh, I know, that's hard to see. Because it's uh, tempting him to break his uh, seven point, I guess. And... Right, while, while we have the good board. Mm -hmm. And it does duplicate rolls like 4, 2 and 4, 1 that make, make a point. Yeah, this one will take. It needs some understanding to come up with this one, I guess. Yeah, it's it's this is hard to see. Of um, course, you can you can see that uh, it doesn't leave a blot on my inner board if you take the um, the two right. eleven, you know. And this is, uh, I guess, what helps. This one, yeah. It doesn't bury the checker deep like this. Yeah. And it unstacks. Um, okay, then the six five was correct. Just come out and bring one down. Then we had the 6-2, which was uh, correct. The, the 2 was forced, and the 6 was just coming down. Mm -hmm. And the 4-2 was a good roll. And, yeah, this was clear to come to the 4-point. You didn't want to leave that blot. 8-4. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's what, that's what you selected. So that's yes, good. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the 5-1, of course, the 5 was good, but then there was no 1. So this was clear because it did all those good things. Mm -hmm. And then the redouble. Yeah, so this was good. Yes. A lot of people think they're behind in the race here, but uh, it's well, still a good redouble. Exactly. For me, when I see his homeboard, it feels like he's got almost no more flexibility left and any other moves he start crunching. And once his, his checkers are moving closer to, like, say, 22, 23, 4, then uh, you know, all this racing points doesn't matter that much anymore. It starts... Right. If we go like this, let's say... Let's say he had the point. Now, I don't think it's a double, right? Yeah, now it's risky, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he has the point. That's that's basically the threat, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what if you put this blo this builder over here? Now it's stronger. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Because so one, not... one pit makes a big difference. Exactly. Okay, so let's see what happened. The 6-4... Oh, it looks like the two plays were close. Okay. Yeah, so good. It's good that we th thought about it, but it didn't really yes. matter. Okay, then there was nothing we could do here until the end. Okay. So the big mistake was there in the beginning that there's... Um... What, which one? This one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I think, yeah, this, this is a concept I actually... Um, discussed with mochi uh about with this so like we did we did a position where it was like something like this and then there was like a five four or a five three for example like how would you play a five three here oh if i make the let's see if my initial instinct was either to make let's say five point or down to ten. Uh, I'm very tempted to make the three point here, but then of course I'm still stuck. My thirteens are still uh, um, stacked, so from that point of view, I bring two yeah. down. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and this one, this one's a blunder. Uh, this is something a lot of people don't think about. You know, when you're behind. In the uh, and um, the opponent has a lot of checkers in the zone. You don't want to split. Um, yeah. Also, if you're going to make the three point, that's nice for now. But the eight point is actually an asset, um, and you only have eight checkers in the zone, so that's not enough to kind of complete a prime mm -hmm. or a blitz. Um, so you have to bring two down here, exactly. uh, yeah. like this, yes. resulting in this position. Now, what if it were a five one? How would you play five one here? Uh, down to eight, and then um, six five. Six five, yeah. 
because uh, 24, 23, it's, uh, you can attack so much there. Yeah. Right. So that's that's really important. If if it were a different situation where the three point were made with a five three instead of a double five, now you can split. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me see the the two plates are tied. Yes. So I think this is this is a very good lesson. Um, for for anybody um very easy to remember when the opponent comes uh, attacks with a double five like this you have to be very cautious of splitting the back checkers yeah absolutely mm -hmm. yeah because of the the blitz you want to avoid blitz the more the more checkers she has in that zone especially sometimes if you split and you roll something like a double five you know right right double five and double fours are very costly and double sixes mm -hmm. Yeah, otherwise the double five, like, uh, what was it like here? If you split and it rolls a double five, it's good. But let's say you play five one here. Mm -hmm. And now the opponent rolls a double five. That's really bad, right? Uh, yeah, he, oh, he loses all his flexibility. He's just building stacks. Mm -hmm. So it turns out like this. And now you're on roll. Yeah, this is uh, horrible for him to have to have towers like that. This is probably a double. Yeah. As Maya once called us, she said, uh, "Building factories." We said, "Building factories is not a good idea in backgammon." Oh yeah, who said that? Maya, my, Maya Paicheva, the Bulgarian female uh, champion there. Okay, I don't know her. Good, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, we call it like candlesticks or stacks. Yeah. Ah, okay. Because it's uh, <laughs> inflexible. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's that's something you want to avoid. And then you start you start end up praying for something like a double one, or something. Right, like right. You know, even though white is ahead by thirty pips, black's yeah. a two to one favorite, mm. and blue is a two to one favorite. Mm. So very good. Let's see. Was there anything else you wanted to kind of review? No, I think that. Uh, there was another move that uh, was uh, error of mine. Is it the number four that we did there? Yeah, this is the one we discussed with the two one. Yes. Okay. So no, that's that's fine on this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. can, just out of curiosity, when he threw the four three, can you tell me what luck it was he got when he kicked me? Four three here. Uh, yeah. Does it show the luck that he got on that on that roll? I just want to see. 174. Okay. Nothing much. Okay. Yeah, I feel like uh, I've, I've talked to people about this. I don't look at the luck. I don't care about luck because the luck is going to be the same in the long run. The only thing I care about, I don't even care if I win the game. I only care about learning. Um, so oh, yes. When, absolutely. I agree with that, Alex. When I play, I just focus on beating myself, you know, my own PR, basically. Um, but sometimes you feel like, well, you're struggling so much. And then you, know, you just want to see if there's a five point difference in luck. And, you know, it's, of course, not to complain, but you realize why the opponent had it so much easier, you know? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just see see a lot of people like complaining about like, oh, let's see the luck. Let's look at the summary. Let me look at the luck. That's like the first thing they look at. Yeah, OK, no, that's not that's not uh, for me. It's the PR for myself, because you like you said, on a long enough timeline, it averages out everything. So that just doesn't matter. You know? Yeah, I think that, let me. Uh, stop this here uh i tell people like to be honest like people were looking at the luck and i had never seen it before so i don't even know how to look at it because you know people focus oh you got lucky you got unlucky okay. that happens that's that's the game that's what happens yes. in backgammon and that's also what happens in life so i think mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good lesson you can't predict the future um you just try your best and see what happens Exactly. And I had to learn this the hard way coming from chess because chess is basically 99% based on your skill, you know, unless you make a silly mistake. And then I realized when I started playing backgammon, you know, I got so frustrated because it was not on my skill. It was basically how the dice I received. I have to just play them. And then I had to, like you said, I have to adjust to it just like life. You must just be ready for it. Just always give your best and then, you know, play the dice as they come. That's what a lot of people like about backgammon. It's compared to chess, where the stronger players 
almost a, you know, a big favorite to, to win mm -hmm. in a chess match. But in backgammon, because of the dice, you can have someone that's very strong and you win, to, you win against them. Exactly. Look, look at last year's Monte Carlo. Uh, some of the big players fell out of the first or second round already, you know? So that was amazing. That was a shocker. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that that happens every time. I play like I play weekly matches, um, and I'm you know in that group I'm one of the strongest players, but I lose all the time. I don't win a hundred percent of the time. Last mm -hmm. year I won sixty two percent of the time. Yes, and I can see you know in this uh, recent tournament I played, we've got really strong players. They've been playing for 20, 30 years back then, and they're really strong, and they didn't even reach halfway through the tournament, and I you know. As, like, like you said, it's just a reminder that anything can happen with backgammon. It's it's amazing, and you just have to take it normally. Calmly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's great. It's great. I had I had a lot of fun. The two goals that I have for these is to have fun and learn. I feel like we 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 accomplished both. Exactly. And talking about luck, this is uh, based on a question you asked uh, recently on the forums about costs and tournaments and stuff and this is what i take into consideration both my skill level where it's at and you know the chances of getting any type of prize money versus the total amount of expenditure i have to do to get there and stuff so i don't want to feel like i spend a lot of money and then it's like a small chance of getting something you know so that's yeah i understand i hmm. think some people look at it as that they're going to a tournament for enjoyment because you go there, you have fun. Not you don't expect to bring home some money. But in the past, it was different. They used to have like a lot of side action money games. So a lot of people, like this was in the seventies and eighties, people would go to a tournament hoping they would get knocked out so they can play in the shuettes. Yeah, I noticed this last year. I went to the Scorpio tournament when I also had the team championships, and whilst uh, the normal tournament were being played there were a lot of tables of course being free and not being used there were people playing amongst themselves and i could see they were betting uh, money you know under the table and under the boards and stuff i was so uh, you know impressed by this or surprised let's put it this way that on the side they had a few hundred here a year a few hundred here a day it was just like flying all over the place it was <laughs> you mean like a side bet on a match or a, sh a chouette on the side um, no, just between two, just between two play players on them side by themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People do that. People do that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, great. So uh, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. I'm happy you came. Uh, you're welcome to come back. Sometimes we, you can get like a doubles partner and we can play again. Do you have any final comments before we conclude? Um, just thank you for having me, Alex. Uh, it was uh, interesting. It was informative as well. And uh, I wish you the success of your show and future channel recordings. Thank you very much. We'll go ahead and conclude. I appreciate that. Thank you to the viewers for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe, and you'll be notified every time I upload a new video. Please let me know what you think in the comments below, what you'd like to see in future videos, so I can work on that. Again, my book, Backgammon, Backgame Strategies, is available. There's a link in the description to where you can get it. And if you're interested in lessons, please contact me via email. My email address is in the description. I look forward to seeing everyone in future videos. And until then, keep rolling your dice.